Ray Bradbury started thinking about space when he was eight, started writing about it when he was 12. When he was 51, the Apollo 15 crew landed on the moon and named a crater after one of his books. Ray Bradbury is one of America's premier science fiction writers. His books include Fahrenheit 451, Something Wicked This Way Comes, Dandelion Wine, The Martian Chronicles, and The Illustrated Man. He's imagined the future in some of his fiction. He's also attempted to conceptualize the future in three-dimensional form. He was idea consultant to the U.S. Pavilion in the 1964 World's Fair, and he worked on the design of Spaceship Earth for the Epcot Center at Disney World. About his writing, Bradbury has said he likes to deal with human problems, like what it would be like to be an average woman on the night before she goes off to Mars to join her husband. His new book is a collection of short stories titled The Toynbee Convector. The first story uses one of the oldest ideas in science fiction, the time machine, but gives it a new twist. Bradbury explains what the story is really about. The problem of the world is doomsayers. We're surrounded by negative people. I can't stand them. I found out about them when I was nine years old. Everyone made fun of me in uh, the fourth or fifth grade because I collected the Buck Rogers comic strips. That was 1929. The future was never going to arrive. And I've been surrounded by people who never believed in the future. And it was true then, it's true today. So I, uh, in that, that particular year, I tore up my comic strips, and a month later, I burst into tears and said to myself, why am I weeping? Who died? And the answer was me. I had allowed these fools to kill me and to kill the future. So from that time on, I decided I'd never listen to another damn fool again in my life. And I went back and collected the Buck Rogers comic strips and ensured my future and began to write about it, became a writer. So I've learned that by doing things, things get done. I'm, I'm, a, uh, I'm not a, an optimist. I'm an optimal behaviorist. So that particular story in my new book, The Toynbee Convector, is based on my conviction that we ensure the future by doing it. You might hate me for giving this away, but um, in your story, The Toynbee Convector, about someone who's traveled back in a time machine, we really find out that um, he never really did travel in a time machine, but what he did was build little miniatures of civilizations and imagine a future. And That's he, correct. And he brought back the architecture that he had imagined from the future, yep. and it was, it was an optimistic vision, which made everybody much more comfortable about the present that they were living in. And reading that, I thought to myself, well, that's in a lot of ways what you've been doing, both as a writer and a designer, is thinking about the future and giving that to us. Um, some of your visions have been optimistic. Some of them have been pessimistic. Well, they're all optimistic. Uh, now, if I do a pessimistic story, <clears throat> then I offer the solution. I don't. I hate people who criticize our society or any society and don't offer solutions. So I feel it's beholden upon the critic to immediately, in the moment of criticism, to offer the solution. So I never am negative about the future without saying, why don't we do this? Uh, I'd like to go down and, and redesign Cape Canaveral. It's, it's not working as a, a theater right now. It should be used as a theater to promulgate the future, and we're not using it. So I have solutions for these things. One of the uh, visions of the future that you had to conceptualize was for the uh, United States Pavilion of the Future for the 1964 World's Fair. Would you think back for us about what you designed for that, what you imagined the future to be back then? Well, the uh, people who were in charge of the United States Pavilion back in uh, 63, 64, 65 came to me and said, can you uh, write a a 400-year history of the United States in 17 minutes flat with a full symphony orchestra. I said, yes, I can do that. And so I, I wrote a prose poem with an orchestra and had it spoken by John McIntyre, and I put in our whole root system of our fabulous past, which indeed is fabulous, and then at the very end told us where we could go with this root system. In other words, it's no use having roots for a tree if you don't um, uh, grow the tree itself and have it produce things. And at the end of my show, I predicted the ultimate victory of a Apollo spacecraft going into space and landing on the moon. And by gosh, a few years later, they did that. Well, it's funny when they did... I think it was when, when they landed on the moon that one of the craters was named after you. Well, it was named after one of my books. I'm sorry, after, after Dandelion Wine. It's called the yeah, Dandelion, Dandelion Crater. Crater. Yeah, I'm very proud of that. Yeah, you must be. Um, 
So, no, no, you're still imagining the future. You're still, uh, you still, you designed one of the Epcot pavilions, I believe, and... Uh... Yeah, the main building, Spaceship Earth, the interior of the building. Uh-huh. And I'm working right now, I'm working with the Euro Disney people to build uh, the Disney um, uh, Disneyland outside of Paris. I'm working for various museums on concepts to go into museums. And I've just created a uh, traveling exhibit of animation for the Disney people, a whole history of animation over a period of 80 years, which will travel to uh, Denver, Seattle, the Museum of Modern Art, and finally wind up at a museum down in Florida. Do you ever, so get, a little, not, do you ever get a little frustrated designing plans for the future that don't necessarily come true? Well, they, they've all come true so far. And, uh, and it's, the, the thing is, uh, we tell fabulous lies. All of our lives are fabulous lies. And then we run to put structures under the lie and make them true. I had to lie to myself when I was 15 that someday I would become a writer. Well, my work was just dreadful. And all through high school and my two or three years out of high school, my stories were terrible. But I had to lie to myself that someday I would become excellent. And by gosh, by writing every day for 20 years, I became excellent. But we we all have to do that. We have to kid ourselves late at night in the midst of our mediocrity that someday we'll be better. Ray Bradbury is my guest, and his latest book is a collection of short stories titled The Toynbee Convector. One of your most, uh, one of your best known books is Fahrenheit 451, mm -hmm. which is about to premiere this fall as an opera. You wrote the libretto. It's set in 2052 AD, uh, in which the, at a time in which the firemen set fires and they set fires to books. They're, they're book burners. Mm -hmm. um, it strikes me as a subject that's uh, unfortunately still very current. Uh, in most countries of the world, not here, thank goodness. Uh, I get letters occasionally from librarians and city councilmen where a few books have been taken off shelves of libraries and they want me to show up and lecture and I say, no, 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 uh, you will make those teeny little tadpoles into big frogs and small puddles. I refuse to dignify stupid people like that. Just wait long enough, keep putting the books back on the shelf and it will blow away. We have ne never had anything here like they had in China 20 years ago when they burned the books and the teachers and the librarians with them by the millions. Um, in the end of Fahrenheit 451, there's a, a colony of people who have preserved books by memorizing them. Uh, I'm sure you've thought about like what book you would have memorized. If, yes, if, I have. Yeah, people ask it, me. Uh -huh. I, I think I would love to be the prefaces to the plays of George Bernard Shaw. Now, that's a huge thing to memorize because it's 2,000 pages of essays about all of his fabulous ideas. He was certainly, uh, to me, the greatest writer of the 20th century. And because he was a pomegranate, just full of exploding seeds on any subject you want to talk about, religion, women's rights, uh, uh, femininity, uh, war, uh, uh, space travel. He, he did it all. I want to ask you uh, about another short story in your new collection, The Toynbee Convector. The story is called The Thing at the Top of the Stairs, mm -hmm. and it's about a, an adult who's very afraid of the dark, as he was as a child, and he's afraid of walking up a staircase, an, an unlit staircase. There's a, a bulb that he has to turn on at, at the top of the staircase, mm -hmm. and he's afraid that waiting at the top of the staircase is a monstrous thing. Um, were you afraid of the dark when you were young? Yeah, that's a true story. Uh, when I was uh, four or five, six years old, uh, we had the bathroom upstairs. And in the middle of the night when I had to go up there, uh, I had to run halfway up the stairs, turn on the light before I could go the rest of the way. Well, when I was doing this, I'd always say to myself, now don't look at the top of the stairs because it will be waiting for you. And I never learned not to look because as soon as I looked up, there it was. It, and it was horrible. And I would scream and fall back down the stairs. And my mother or father would get up and sigh and say, oh, my God, here we go again. And they'd turn the light on for me and let me go upstairs. And so this is a vivid memory in my mind. And I write it so that other people, I suppose, reading it, will remember their own thing at the top of the stairs. What shape did that it have in your mind? That's a very hard thing to describe. I suppose it had a different shape every single night, maybe as the result of my seeing certain 
uh, horror films that I dearly loved. You know, we all love horror films. And I saw The Hunchback of Notre Dame when I was three, The Phantom of the Opera when I was six. I think The Phantom stayed with me the longest. And it was probably The Phantom up there, with the moment when uh, Patsy Ruth Miller tears off the mask of Lon Chaney and his, his face is uh, revealed in all its gruesome detail. I'm glad you mentioned The Hunchback of Notre Dame, too, because uh, it's a movie I used to watch over and over and over again when I was growing up. The first time I saw it, it just terrified me. But I, yeah, had, to, I had to keep watching it again and again. I loved it so much. Um, uh, did that movie scare you? I don't know if it scared me. It touched me. Even mm -hmm. when you're three years old, yeah. the the Lon Chaney version was uh, very sympathetic and, and sad and very moving. And uh, then the Charles Lawton version was the same way. I think all of us, no matter how we look, born into this world, feel something like the hunchback. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if you have a beautiful face or not. I've talked to a lot of beautiful people in later years and found out that they went through the same thing in high school that I did. I, I went around with my face down most of the time because I was suffering from the usual outbreaks on the face that most kids of that age have. But then in later years, I, um, I met some uh, beautiful women and beautiful men, and they all confessed to the same feeling, regardless of how they looked. I think the the Casamoto appeals to all of us. It was the Charles Lawton version that 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 I've seen the most times. Now I, I know you worked with Charles Lawton, yep. um, in, including working with him on an unproduced version of Fahrenheit 451. Did you ever talk with him about how potent the Hunchback of Notre Dame was for you? Oh uh, yes, I did, and we had a wonderful friendship uh, for a whole year there. About 30 years ago, I worked on a science fiction operetta for for Charles and Elsa, Elsa Lanchester, his wife. So that meant I was over at the house at least one day a week for almost a year. And he put on performances of the various Shakespearean plays for me, or scenes from the plays, scenes from Othello or Hamlet, or he did Lear at... Uh, in England uh, one year, and I was privy to his ideas on how to do Lear, or when he directed Major Barbara or The Apple Cart by Shaw. And the one thing that Charles Lawton gave to me that I've kept as a gift for all the years and has changed my life is him saying to me, use language for God's sake, because there's no language in the American theater anymore. We have no playwrights who use language, who care about saying something so beautiful and so correct. Uh, it has to be correct, it has to be true, but it can be beautiful, that it moves the heart and changes the lives of the people who see it. So when I went into full-time theater work, uh, where I actually started when I was 12, but came back uh, into it when I was 30, I dared to write language plays, and I'm still writing them. Uh, you can listen to what I have to say, and it sounds good, as well as being true. Um, I want to get back to the fear that you felt when you were in the dark climbing up the stairs as a, as a mm -hmm. child. Um, is, is that kind of uh, terror a uh, good experience for us, for a writer, especially someone who spends part of their time writing science fiction? Or, or fantasy or any other thing. Mm -hmm. Any experience that, that touches you in any particular way is good. Uh, uh, it can be a horrible experience. I saw a car crash when I was 15 here in Los Angeles, and uh, five people died as a result of it. I arrived at the scene of the accident within 20 seconds of hearing the collision. Uh, it was the worst mistake I ever made in my life. I didn't know what I was running into. Uh, people had been uh, horribly mangled and decapitated. So for months after, I, I was shaken by them. It's probably the reason I never learned to drive. Uh, I was terrified at automobiles for a long time after that. But it, I turned it into a short story called The Crowd uh, six or seven years later, and that was part of my Ray Bradbury television theater two years ago. It was one of the things we produced. So out of this horror, this really terrible event, you take something that, has taught you a certain kind of fear, I suppose, and you pass it on to others and say, this is what the car can do. Huh? This is an example of what the car can do. You know, some writers have made a lot out of the fact that you don't drive 
You know, the irony, one of America's premier science fiction writers, envisioners of the future, mm-hmm. doesn't drive a car. Uh, has that ever seemed um, ironic to you, or do you just uh, accept that there's reasons you don't want to drive? No, it's no different than love poetry, is it? We don't write love poetry in the middle of an affair, do we? We write love poetry when we're away from our loved one, or we anticipate a loved one. It's it's lack that gives us inspiration. Huh? It's not fullness. Occasionally, fullness can do that. But uh, not ever having driven... Uh, I can write better about automobiles than the people who drive them. I have a distance here. Perhaps I have a secret yearning to own a Maserati someday and go to hell. I don't know. But uh, uh, space travel is another good example. I'm never going to go to Mars. But I've helped inspire, thank goodness, those people who have built the rockets and sent our photographic equipment off to Mars. So it's, it's always a lack, though that causes you to write that kind of story. Have you had any direct correspondence with astronauts who've traveled through space? Well, I've met most of them, thank goodness. Life magazine sent me down to Houston back in early 1967, and I met 60 of them. This, this, the Apollo missions were just beginning. So I got to meet almost everyone who finally wound up on the moon, and I bump into them on occasion over the years. Uh, It's a wonderful part of my life. I feel very fortunate that I not only started out with Buck Rogers in 1929, but wound up down at Houston, Cape Canaveral, in my own lifetime. I thought I would be a very old man by the time we landed on the moon. Well, I was only 49. And uh, I feel privileged to be part of this greatest age in the history of the world. Has the reality of space travel made speculation about space more or less interesting? more interesting because it involves our philosophy, it involves our sense of theology, it involves our sense of the miraculous. I mean, after all, we've been trying to figure out for tens of centuries, haven't we, what our place in the universe is, uh, why we were created to be on the world, uh, why we were given this opportunity to live, and I have my own answers. Uh, I have a religious uh, relationship with the universe, and all the word religion means is to bind yourself to, to relate to, to gather all the sticks, all the facts, and look at them and try to figure out what it's all about. We're we're faced with two strange things, aren't we? The gift of life and the gift of death, and we haven't figured out either one. So space travel only intensifies our sense of obligation to the gift of life, to promulgate it, to go to the moon, to go to Mars, to go on beyond uh, our uh, solar system and to take our civilization with it uh, on the journey to Alpha Centauri. Uh, With all our stupidities, with all our inanities, with all our destruction, with all the things that we hate, but along with all the things that we love and all the things that are brilliant and all the things that are creative. So we have this darkness within us and we have this bright light within us and we're going to take both of them and I accept that. I want to talk with you more about your ideas but first we're going to take a short break. My guest is Ray Bradbury whose latest collection of short stories is titled The Toynbee Convector. This is Fresh Air. Fresh Air is produced live at WHYY in Philadelphia and distributed by National Public Radio. Bradbury is my guest. His many books include The Martian Chronicles, The Illustrated Man, Fahrenheit 451, and his newest, The Toynbee Convector. He's also written many plays and has served as a design consultant for several exhibits on the future. Let's talk about um, some of your movies. Now, uh, Fahrenheit 451 was made into a movie directed by Louis Malle. The, your story no, is, no, no, no. Uh, did Francois I say Francois Truffaut? Truffaut. I, I didn't yeah. mean that. It's <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, the Illustrated Man was made into a movie. Now, you actually wrote the screenplay for a book that um, had nothing to do with your books, Moby Dick. 
That's right. And you, you really, I have to say, seemed like a very unlikely choice <laughs> to adapt Moby Dick for the screen. And I was wondering how you got to write the screenplay. Well, um, by staying true to my own sense of the poetic. Uh, again, here's where uh, um, the influence of Shakespeare on my life, the influence of, uh, of the Bible, which I was raised on. And by staying true to my love of poetry and my love of metaphor, which you learn from the Old Testament, the New Testament, and you learn it from Shakespeare, to speak in tongues huh, that are so vivid that people remember the metaphor. And also by staying in love with dinosaurs. I fell in love with dinosaurs when I was five. And I was walking along the shore with my wife one night down Venice, California, this is 1949, and we found the, uh, the ruins of the old Venice Pier, all the bones and the skeleton, uh, the tracks and the ties of the roller coaster lying there in the sea. And I turned to my wife and I said, I wonder what that dinosaur is doing lying here on the shore. Uh, she was very careful not to answer, and three nights later, and I heard uh, something in the middle of the night. I sat up in bed, looked at all the fog out beyond the window, and way out in the Santa Monica Bay, I heard the braying, the calling, the oconing of the foghorn over and over and over again. And I said, yes, that's it. The dinosaur heard the foghorn blowing, thought it was another dinosaur calling from a billion years of slumber, and swam for an encounter, discovered it was only a damned lighthouse and a damned foghorn, tore the whole thing down, and died of a broken heart on the beach. So next day I got out of bed and wrote The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, sent it to the Saturday Evening Post. It was published. Uh, John Houston read that one story, huh? And that changed my life forever because he thought he smelled the ghost of Melville in that story. Oh, what, he oh, sm oh. what he smelled in it was the ghost of Shakespeare and the ghost of the, the Bible. Huh? And so he called me on the phone and offered me the job. And, and um, uh, a year later, when I was working on the screenplay one night, I said, John, how did I get this job? You know, everyone thought you were crazy. He said, well, I read that story about the dinosaur. And uh, I said, well, I was very honest with you. I told you when I met you, I'd never read Melville. But once I got into Melville, I discovered he had been inspired by the same people who inspired me. So we were twins. He had been um, called upon by Shakespeare to cough up the white whale. So Shakespeare uh, came into his life very late. He had never read Shakespeare until he was 30 years old. And then Melville went off to Boston, found an edition of Shakespeare with large type. He had very weak eyes. That's the reason he'd never read him. Went home and fell madly in love with Shakespeare, threw all the whaling equipment out the, the door, and Shakespeare came under his window one night and called up to him and said, Oh, Herman Melville, truly come you forth, but come you forth dressed as whale. And he breached the damned whale from, from out of the brow of Melville. And that's how Moby Dick got born. Okay, well, uh, must have been pretty daunting to write the screenplay, uh, write, rewriting uh, Melville and then working with one of the great American directors, John Huston. And that'll teach you to ask a small question. Yeah, that's right. Uh, show answer. me a thing or two, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, y you know, uh, I'm thinking of you writing in movies and trying to rec writing working in movies and trying to reconcile that with something you once said. You, you once said, every time I get in a huge crowd of so-called creative people, I am not happy. Uh, why not? I, know, I wonder why I said that. Where did you see hey, that? Hey, don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I forgot to write down where, where you'd said that. It was no, I'm not, I don't think that's true. I, uh, I must have said something unlike that because I am very happy around creative people. I've been working with the Disney people on and off for 18 years, and I am as happy with them as someone playing basketball or football. I, I, the, uh, I have yet to meet anyone in the Disney organization, especially among the Imagineering people who built Disneyland, Disney World, and uh, Epcot, that I didn't like because we're all children and we play together and we have fun. And I go home every night happy and I say to my wife, my gosh, I've been playing all day and they pay me for this. It's, and you, you almost hate to take the money. You started writing for science fiction. Uh, you started writing short stories. I forget whether it was for weird tales or amazing stories. Super science. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, the, the, the uh, science fiction genre has 
changed a lot over the years since you've been writing. Right. And uh, I wonder if the broadening of science fiction has affected your writing personally. I don't pay attention to these things. Uh, when an idea hits me, I do it. doesn't matter what field it's in. Um, if it happens to be science fiction, swell. If it's fantasy, which is totally different, swell. If it's a murder mystery, good, I'll do that. Or I want to do a play, or I want to write a poem. Uh, instantly, I just go do it. I never, uh, if we could only train our children to do things, huh? Don't think about them. Don't talk about them. Go do it. And when it's done, then you can talk about it. Then you can show it to people. So I never think about, uh, I'm just busy doing all my things and uh, trying to figure out new ways that, on occasion of, uh, of, of saying old things, saying the obvious, but saying it in a new way. Do you read science? Oh, yes, of course. But I'm not a scientist. I'm not a technician. I can't tell you how to build a rocket or a nuclear plant. I, I'm a moralizer on occasion. And if I don't like the way things are going, then I write about that. But I, I try to keep up with, especially magazines like the Smithsonian. A scientific American is too scientific for me. I don't understand it. I wish I did. But I have the same problem with Wall Street Week every Friday night. And I watch that and I turn to my wife and say, uh, did you understand that? She said, no. I said, thank God, because <laughs> I didn't either. You've spent a lot of time imagining what the future might be like. Mm -hmm. What would you most like to be around to see about the future? I'd like to come back every 50 years and see how we can use certain technological advan advances to our advantage, say, in education. I think we're doing a dreadful job of educating now. We're spending... 200 billion a year, 300 billion, whatever the figure it is, a heck of a lot of money and we're getting very small results because we're neglecting the first grade and the second grade. That's where the whole thing lies. And we have to revamp all of our ideas about the first and second grade, which means intensifying... Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. You, you don't want to come back and find out if we've landed on Mars or not and if there's oh, life no, on Mars. You want to come not, back and see how the grade schools are doing. It's not going to do any good to <laughs> land on Mars if we're stupid. Uh-huh. And I want to save the, the, the future generation. I want to teach them to read when they're five and six and seven years old. If we don't do that, we lose them forever. It's no use having remedial reading, which takes years of time when you can do the whole thing in the first grade. We have to intensify uh, our objectives there. It won't cost any money. It doesn't cost a darn thing. First grade is very cheap. It's the later grades where you've got to spend money if you don't do it right. Okay, well, I want to thank you so much for talking with us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. My guest has been Ray Bradbury. His new book is titled The Toynbee Convector. It's published by Knopf. An opera version of his Fahrenheit 451 is scheduled to premiere this fall. I'm Terry Gross, and this is Fresh Air. Our senior producer is Danny Miller. Our producers are Amy Sallett, Phyllis Myers, and Naomi Person. Production assistance from Ed Doherty and Deborah Beagle. Research assistance from Martin Foyes. Our engineer is Ojiva Blytis. Chris Spurgeon directs the show. I'm Terry Gross. Thanks for listening.